Angela and I stood by the front desk, busying ourselves with dumb stories and corny jokes as the clock crept forward. I'm no stranger to long, boring graveyard shifts, but that night in particular seemed especially slow. At least Angela was there to keep me company. She had just reached the end of her tale about the rogue squirrel that had entered her apartment when the automatic door slid open behind me. And that wasn't even the worst. Angela's eyes drifted towards the door when she suddenly froze mid-sentence. Her jovial smile melted away, and her cheeks drained of color. I turned to see what had made her freeze. A woman walked solemnly inside the front sliding doors, her face concealed by long, inky black hair. Her alabaster skin seemed to almost glow in the fox LED lighting. Her stomach bulged out from her tight black gown, and droplets of blood and other bodily fluids dripped on her legs, forming a glistening, sanguine trail behind her. She stopped several feet from the front desk and lifted her head. Her face was devoid of any sort of expression, and eyes appeared entirely vacant of emotion. Her gaze drifted towards Angela, and then slowly turned to me. I felt goosebumps sprout all over my skin. Ma'am, are you okay? Angela muttered, her voice trembling. The woman remained silent for a moment, blood continuing to drip from between her legs. My baby. Her voice was flat and conveyed no sense of emotion at all. Angela and I exchanged terrified glances. Okay, um, are you in labor? I don't know why I bothered asking, but the sight of her just caught me off guard. Her head slowly turned, and her soulless eyes seemed to drill holes directly through me. Angela grabbed the phone and began dialing as I hesitantly approached the woman. We're gonna help you, ma'am, okay? I asked, heart pounding in my chest as I crept closer. She stared at me the entire way, with wide, unblinking, dark brown eyes. I grabbed a wheelchair and I coaxed the woman to take a seat. And to my surprise and incredible relief, she sat down without any question, still showing zero signs of discomfort despite her condition. I got her back to the birthing center and I began the usual routine. I got her synced with the heart rate monitor, installed an IV and readied for the procedure. All the while, the nameless woman laid motionless and silent on the bed. What's your name? The woman gave no response. She didn't even seem to acknowledge the question. Dr. Matheson finally arrived several minutes later, accompanied by two other nurses, Jennifer and Sandra. Good evening, ma'am. My name is Dr. Matheson, and we're going to help you, okay? How are you feeling? The woman didn't respond, only looked at the doctor with those dark eyes. A moment of awkward silence and uncertainty filled the room as the doctor made preparations. In the eyes of the two other nurses, I began to see a twinkle of fear. Both of them turned to me individually, and the gleam seemed to increase when they noticed my own expression. The sentiment did not seem to be shared by Dr. Matheson. My baby... The woman echoed her words from earlier, almost in a whisper that time. Matheson paused and glanced over to her. He hesitated a moment and he looked her over before a smile formed on his face. Yes, ma'am. You've gone into labor, so we will deliver your baby now. What's your name? He yeah, asked, sitting down in front of her. The woman said nothing. The other two nurses began their tasks and Matheson shot me a look. He must have sensed my discomfort, because he suddenly appeared slightly on edge as well. The four of us finalized the preparations and Jennifer administered the epidural. Dr. Matheson moved in as the woman's abdominal contractions continued, all the while she remained completely unreactive. I don't even think that I saw her blink. You come to expect shrieks of pain from the mother, and the crying that ensues. What I never would have expected was complete silence. 
It was the most unnerving child delivery I had ever witnessed. Within five minutes, the head of the child had begun to crown. Okay, give me a big push now and there we go. Dr. Matheson pulled the newborn out from the womb and into the world. Still the woman did not so much as flinch. And here we go. Congratulations, ma'am. It's a... He paused, inspecting the newborn in his arms. His expression twisted to a confused grimace. Jennifer and Sandra quickly turned to mimic his display. Boy. The word fell like broken glass from his lips, as he stared infatuated at the newborn in his arms. I expected crying, but the child, just like his mother, was silent. I rounded the bedside in order to get a better view. I wished that I hadn't. The first thing that I noticed were his eyes, wide, obsidian, and beaming, at least twice the size of an infant's eyes that I've ever seen. His head was oblong and sharp, with mad gray skin like the color of wet concrete. His nose was flat, almost pancaked on his face with a mouth that was much too large. His body was incredibly skinny and elongated, long narrow arms, fingers, and a thin neck. He didn't cry, didn't squirm, and had it not been for the slow rhythmic fluctuations of his little chest, I would have thought that it was a stillbirth. He was like no child that I'd ever seen. Dr. Matheson quickly composed himself and wiped away his unkept grimace. He handed the baby over to Sandra, whose face was still frozen in disbelief. She took him carefully and wrapped him in a blanket. Dr. Matheson then turned to me and attempted to smile. Without warning, the vitals monitor suddenly went crazy, indicating cardiac arrest. Our attention shot back to the woman, who was convulsing violently upon the bench. Bits of foam was dribbling out from her mouth and her eyes were pinned wide open. The defib. Matheson yelled, moving to her. I readied the defibrillator and I moved to his side. The electrical whir began as I held the paddles, when her vitals suddenly flatlined. Matheson seized the chest palpitations and the woman lay with wide eyes and a gaping mouth. I moved in but he stopped me. It was already too late. She was gone. Her death was marked officially at 1.47 a.m. The veil was drawn over the unknown woman, and the coroner was notified. I don't think that image of her post-mortem stare will ever leave my mind. Her baby was placed in the nursery soon after, and the rest of us attempted to rationalize what had happened. Sandra and I got the baby set up in his crib without a word said between us. I searched my mind for any sort of diagnosis that could possibly explain his condition, but I came up with nothing. And part of me took pity on the poor boy for his deformities and the sudden orphaning, but another greater part of me was absolutely terrified by his appearance. Doing okay, Cassandra. I jumped a bit from the sudden intrusion, and I turned to see Dr. Matheson stroll up behind me, wiping his hands off with a cloth. I nodded to him and tried to appear more confident than I felt. And Dr. Matheson stood beside me and stared in the window of the nursery. It's always hard when you lose someone, especially like that. Dr. Matheson had always been a tad bit socially awkward, but I felt real sincerity in his voice. I shook my head. I just don't get it. She was fine. How does that happen? Dr. Matheson shrugged. It could be a lot of things. A traumatic brain edema, a pulmonary embolism... An aneurysm. Hard to say for sure until the autopsy. His words did little to numb the stinging sensation in my mind. All of the sudden madness had just transpired so quickly. One second, I was nonchalantly shooting the breeze with Angela and the next, watching a silent mother give birth to... a boy. He was still just an innocent child, and I needed to remember that. And despite how much it made my skin crawl to even look at him. What's wrong with him? The words just slipped out. 
Dr. Matheson stared at the boy through the glass of the nursery, his face unwavering and reserved. I'm not entirely sure. My first thought was plagiocephaly, but this would be by far the most severe and bizarre case that I had ever seen. And it doesn't really account for the solid black sclera on the iris either. Dr. Matheson crossed his arms and stared at the boy in his cradle. Poor baby. My heart twisted in nods as I looked. Being deformed both physically and likely mentally as well. He had a tough road ahead of him, especially without his mother. Any idea who she was? Dr. Matheson shook his head. Not right now. It'll probably be a while before we know that. He lifted his arm and he snuck a peek at his watch beneath his sleeve. I should probably get to the paperwork. He paused and he turned to face me entirely. You gonna be okay? I nodded, doing my best to appear genuine. Good. Let me know if there's anything that you need, or if anything else happens. He then turned and walked away, leaving me alone once again. I turned my attention one last time to the boy, and I found his eyes locked on me. I returned to the main lobby to find an anxious Angela waiting at the desk. She perked up as she saw me meander around the corner, but her nervous demeanor hadn't changed. You okay, Cass? She asked, approaching me. I nodded and took a deep breath. Yeah, I'm fine. We lost her, though. The words made Angela flinch. And the baby? He's alive, bud. I trailed off and I shook my head. He's not alright. Angela stared back, confused. What do you mean? I paused for a moment to consider the situation. What did I mean? I can't even begin to describe the feeling of dread that was injected into me each time I looked at him. I feel all the more terrible for admitting it as he was just a child, but I can't ignore that feeling. You just need to see for yourself. Angela gave a pensive smile and pulled me in for a hug. She held me tight for a moment, and I took the well-needed embrace to try and collect my thoughts. As we held one another, I heard something. It began as a dull hissing sound, like air leaking from a tank. It almost clicked in a way. That doesn't even make sense, but I don't know how else to describe it. The sound got steadily louder. What the hell is that? Angela asked as we withdrew from one another. The sound rose again and above us, the light seemed to grow brighter. The noise then rose exponentially, to a point where I thought my ears were about to rupture. Both of us clenched at our ears, and a pop was heard above us. Angela and I flinched as the bulb violently burst. A symphony of breaking glass and began as hundreds of light bulbs on our floor shattered randomly. Angela and I ducked as the ear-splitting crescendo continued and the bulbs annihilated themselves by the dozens. The lobby grew dimmer and dimmer as the bulbs continued to rupture, until the last one popped, leaving us shrouded by darkness. The hissing noise also vanished with the light. Angela and I shuddered from the event and I heard a minuscule groan of fear escape her lip as we rose to our feet. You okay, Ange? Yeah, what the hell just happened? Cautiously, the two of us rose from the floor and tried to refocus our bearings. There was not a single light source active, with even the small LEDs on the computer being dark. The only light at all was from the moon shining through the lobby windows. It must be a power outage, I thought. But then I realized, I heard the beeping of medical equipment further down the hall, and the fan inside Angela's computer could be heard worrying. The power was still on, only the lights had been destroyed. A door opened a ways away and a light suddenly appeared down the hall. The pitter-patter of rushed footsteps emanated soon after. Angela and I moved to hide, thinking it was some intruder. But then a familiar voice called out, Angela, Cass, are you guys in here? The voice was that of Victor, the night shift maintenance guy. Yeah, yeah, we're here. Angela called back as the two of us rose to meet him. 
I pulled out my phone and I flicked out my flashlight as Victor reached us. You guys okay? He asked us, beads of sweat glistening on his forehead as he breathed heavily. Yeah, we're fine. What was that? Angela asked. Victor shook his head and shined his light down the hall. Not sure. It must have been an electrical surge or something. Pretty weird. Suddenly my mind returned to my priorities. I've got to check on the patients. Victor nodded and glanced around the vicinity. I'll go with you. Angela added. Okay, yeah. You guys do what you gotta do. I'm gonna go see if I can get some of the lights back up. The three of us then split off and Angela and I made our way to check on the patients. The elevators still seemed operable, but we didn't trust it. We took the stairs to the second floor where the in-house patients were capped. There were five patients in our custody at the time, not including the four newborns in the nursery. Amazingly, three of which were still sleeping peacefully, as if nothing had even happened. The other two, an elderly man by the name of Hugh, and a middle-aged woman named Nicole were, understandably, a bit distressed. I tended to Hugh while Angela tended to Charlotte. I did my best to comfort the old man, and I assured him that a simple electrical issue was to blame for all the ruckus. He seemed to calm after a few minutes and I settled him back into his bed. I reminded him of the panic button if he needed me, and I took my leave to check on the other patients. The other nurses, Jennifer and Sandra, were nowhere to be found. It was about 2.17am, meaning both were probably on their lunch break. Dr. Matheson was also absent. I rejoined Angela in the hall and we discussed our options for a moment. And that's when we heard it. The sound that officially made my heart drop. A scream. From the floor beneath us, a blood-curdling scream of a man reverberated throughout the empty plastic corridors. I felt ice form in my veins, and my knees turned to jello beneath me. The man continued shrieking at the top of his lungs, and appeared to be moving around the ground floor rapidly. Suddenly his voice was cut off, and the silence returned. Angela and I froze, and neither of us speaking. That same sound from earlier then returned but only for a brief moment. There was a crash of debris after that, swift footsteps and the banging of something hitting metal. Angela and I then heard it at the same time, a sound in the stairwell that we had come up. I turned. I saw the handle on the door slowly beginning to twist. We scrambled away and quickly hid underneath the middle reception desk. In the sudden panic, I had dropped my phone. It landed face down on the floor with the flashlight beaming upwards on the pale ceiling tiles. Angela and I huddled together underneath the desk, and from down the corridor, we heard the door slowly creep open. It bumped against the wall and I held my breath. The plopping of slow footsteps and ventured methodically from its depths. My initial thought was that somebody had come to rob us. Maybe a junkie looking to score some prime painkillers or something but the footsteps were bizarre, not fumbling or rushed in any way as a desperate addict might be. They were slow, calculated, wet. They sounded barefoot with squelching steps that slapped against the floor. I felt cold tears begin to sting my eyes as the dreadful sound approached. They stopped only a few feet away. I couldn't see the person from under the desk, but a strong scent hit my nose. It was like mildew mixed with copper, pungent and slightly metallic. Angela squeezed so tight around my chest that I thought that I might pass out. It felt like we sat there frozen for hours, but in reality, it was probably only a couple of seconds. And then the hissing sound returned. It was louder and more defined than before. It felt like my ears were on fire. The light on my phone then suddenly vanished and the noise stopped. I felt blood beginning to drip from my ears as a new noise filled the vicinity. My heart lurched and I recognized the distinctive wail of the infant from further down the hall. The footfall started up again, now venturing away from us. I withdrew from Angela as the steps got more distant. Carefully I leaned to the side to look at the half-dome mirror on the ceiling. It was dark. 
with the only light being a conglomerate of the streetlights outside and the moon above. In the mirror, I saw a tall, nearly built man slinking down the corridor. He was hunched but still stood like a tower in the hallway. He was almost completely naked. Suddenly a horrible realization occurred to me as the sounds of the infantile cries continued. He was going for the babies. He disappeared from the mirror's reflection. Their cries and innocent pleas for help drove nails into my heart. I couldn't just abandon them. My conscience was all but screaming at me to take action, but my mind countered by flooding with terror stronger than I had ever felt before. Somehow the conscience went out, and before I could truly assess the situation, I found myself rising on my wobbly legs. The blood was cemented my veins, and each trembling step I took was like wading through a river. I had to help them. I would have never forgiven myself. What are you doing? Angela yelled in a whisper as I exited our hiding spot. Call the police. I saw no signs of the man anywhere as I grabbed the fire extinguisher on the wall. With a quick prayer, I gave chase to the man. I skirted around the corner and I approached the nursery, the fire extinguisher in hand and my mind stampeding a million miles a minute. I halted as my legs carried me to the window of the nursery. Inside was pitch black and I only could hear crying. And then I heard a crack and the door began to open. I ducked away and I managed to scramble behind a small cabinet just as his head poked out. From the circular mirror on the ceiling, I saw the man crawl outwards on his haunches. His arms cradled something in his chest, and slowly he rose to a mostly upright position. The hospital ceiling is over eight feet tall, and yet the man couldn't even stand fully upright. He passed by the windows in the hall, and I saw his grayish skin illuminated in the light. His arms and neck were lanky with spindly fingers and a stretched, slender head. It was in that moment that I fully became aware of what I should have already known. It was not a man. All previous thoughts of heroism immediately fled, and I quivered in my hiding spot behind the small cabinet. I chickened out. I won't even try to deny it. The thing terrified me beyond anything I had ever known. I was shaking so badly that the fire extinguisher slipped momentarily from my grip. I caught it, but not before the tank's stem nicked against the wall. I heard the thing halt further down the hall. Tears filled my eyes as a sense of fear greater than I had ever known filled my soul to the brim. I closed my eyes and I held my breath. I heard the thing move around further down the hall, and then fall silent. Slowly, I opened my eyes, and I peeked around the cabinet. My eyes struggled to see anything, and my heart was beating so loud that I couldn't hear it. And then I saw it. It was right there, staring back at me from the shadows. It was motionless on its knuckles and not twenty feet down the hall. I shrieked and I fell backwards onto my back. I couldn't take my eyes off of it, and for several seconds we just maintained our deadlock gaze. I was a deer in headlights, frozen salad. I held the fire extinguisher close, sure that the thing was about to charge and my bladder was about to give out. But it just sat there, with its precious bundle squirming on the ground behind it. And my eyes then adjusted. Two impossibly large obsidian eyes stared from the shadows, and beneath them, a gaping granite mouth. I saw dozens of needle-like teeth glint in its open mouth. It didn't move a muscle. Suddenly I saw its jaw flex, and the concussion of that horrendous shriek struck my ears. It lasted only a split second, but it felt like I had been hit by a bat. I fell back and I clutched my head as a splitting headache began. I was sure that I was about to die. But then the creature turned and grabbed its bundle once more. In a flash, it began galloping down the hall, and within seconds, it was gone. I must have fainted after that, or maybe the audio blast in that thing knocked me out. All I know is that I awoke to bright lights and beeping medical equipment. My mother was there waiting for me. She hugged me when she saw me stir and asked me what had happened. I didn't tell her though. I just didn't know what to say. A flurry of cops and hospital staff traversed the halls and came in and out of the room. 
I asked about Angela and thankfully, I was told that she was peacefully sleeping in another room. A few of the officers asked me questions, but I didn't tell them much. I was petrified of being seen as insane. I only told them that some very tall naked man had broken in and taken something. They pressed me for more, but I didn't say anything else. Victor had been found mutilated on the ground floor. The screaming from the previous night had apparently come from him. And Dr. Matheson as well had been found dead just outside of the front doors his head very nearly torn entirely from his neck. Sandra and Jennifer were fine, at least physically, as were the infants in the nursery. All except for the newest one, that is. He was gone. Some other guys in suits came in and questioned me as well. They looked like the FBI, black suits and hats, but they never confirmed that. They asked me a lot of questions, but again, I didn't say much. They didn't tell me much and for a while, I think they even considered me as a suspect. After a while though, I think they realized I wasn't going to be much help to their investigation. They then left suddenly, almost frantic without another word. I was released a few days later and given a week off to recover from the event. I don't think I could do that in a lifetime though. I expected to see coverage of it on the news or something, but there hasn't been anything. I did manage to find out one thing though. They found out who the pregnant woman was. I bumped into one of the cops at a coffee shop a few days later and he told me about it. At first he was reluctant to share anything, but after I had told him that I had been there that night, he relented. He couldn't tell me the woman's name as it was an ongoing investigation, but he said that the last time anybody had seen her alive was back in 2006. She was only 11 years old at the time, when she inexplicably disappeared from her parents' home. The case had long since gone cold, and she was presumed to be dead, only for her to suddenly reappear over 12 years later, and just a couple of miles from where she was last seen. The officer admitted that they did not know how she got to the hospital that night, where she had been during all those years, or who the father of her child was. I don't expect many more answers and it's clear that they don't really want people talking about this. I've admitted a lot of personal details, because I just don't want to get in trouble. I don't suppose many will take this account seriously anyways, especially with the lack of news coverage. I do hope that the families of Victor and Dr. Matheson will be okay, but even that seems like a lot to ask. As for that thing I saw that night, your guess is as good as mine. I haven't been able to find anything online about it. I don't know what the hell that thing was, but I do know that now, there are at least two of them, possibly three soon. I've been back at work for almost a month now, and no one has seen or heard from Jennifer in over a week.